Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something very important uh, today in this short study. Um, I have mentioned uh, recently that I've found <laughs> some mistakes, some errors in my understanding in regards to the sixth seal, especially uh, uh, giving understanding to Isaiah 28 and 29. Well, I'm ready to make it right. And we're going to, of course, match this up to Matthew 24. This is going to be a good hour-long lesson, so you may want to watch this in parts. But I promise you, now you're going to have even a better understanding of the entire day of the Lord after this short study. So this is a new PNG file that I have for you. This short study, as I was putting it together, matching up the day of the Lord, uh, which is found in many places in the Holy Bible, but I specifically wanted to match up Isaiah 29 and Joel 2 because they match up so well. You can tell they're meant to be taught together at the same time. But by doing this short study of the day of the Lord in Isaiah 29 and Joel 2, it helped me understand my mistakes of Isaiah 28. All right, and now we're going to put it all together. And we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures. So sit down, get comfortable, get your Bibles open. I hope you're viewing this not on a smart device. I hope you're viewing this on a large desktop monitor, okay, or maybe even your television. I want you to be able to see all of this easily. Um, here we go. Now, here's a, a verse in Matthew 24 where everyone is still, still debating today within the church. What does this mean? Well, you're not going to have any questions after this short study. What does verse 39 mean? And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Okay. You're going to know what that means if you stay with me for this hour or so short study on the day of the Lord. And, and you're going to finally be able to give understanding of Isaiah 28 correctly, which I haven't been doing. Um, of course, we know that a lot of Christians believe that this is the rapture that snatches up, that takes away those who are ready, who abide in Christ. No, that's not. The rapture is real and it is coming, but this ain't it. All right, I'm going to show you what this is. And you could see it in Isaiah 28, Isaiah 29, Joel 2, Hosea 5, Jeremiah 25. Okay, I'm going to show you what this is. This isn't even a flood of water. Okay, there's going to be a lot of rain and storms and tempests throughout the entire day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord starts at the sixth seal, not at the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus on the last day, which a lot, a lot of people make that mistake. No, the day of the Lord starts at the sixth seal. And it's this whole process of judging the world, starting with the nation of Israel. Okay, all of it's the day of the Lord, all of it's the great day of the Lord, all of it's the great and terrible, great and awesome, great and unusual, great and dreadful. It's all the day of the Lord. Now, in Isaiah 28, this is where I used to go wrong. Okay, all right, you see this right here. Then you will be trampled down by it as often as it goes out. It will take you. It will pass over. This is talking about uh, the overflowing scourge of this chapter in Isaiah 28. And I used to say that's the end of the day of the Lord, phase two, battle of the great day of God Almighty, when Father comes back and brings Jesus, and Jesus will pass over the land in judgment. And that's when all that belong to him will be gathered to him. And that's all true. But this, it will take you, is not the seventh bowl, rapture, or the gathering together of all who belong to Jesus. That's not what this it is and will be that shall pass over 
and pass through the land. Okay, this is the the event that starts the day of the Lord, phase one. Okay, that's what this is. And when you get down here, again, I was getting this wrong. Okay, and you're going, I'll prove it to you in this short study using Isaiah 29 matched up with Joel 2. All right. See, when I, before, when I read the Lord will rise up, and I've done studies using the, uh, the phrase rise up, the Lord will rise, arise. And I thought that those key phrases always meant the appearing of Jesus at the seventh bowl. But that's not what this means. Because this is the Lord rising up to trample Ephraim. And we're, we're going to look at all of Isaiah 28. Like I said, this is going to be a long lesson. This is the trampling of Ephraim. This is the trampling of Judah. And I'm going to show you what the flood is that will take you during the trampling of Judah. This is not the time that their Redeemer comes at the seventh bowl on the last day to start the battle of the great day of God Almighty when the Lord is defending his people, defending Jerusalem, okay? Freeing the one-third of Israel's Israeli slaves. All right, that's not what this rising up of the Lord is. And th this is the verse that just caused me to go, oh no, the Lord's just telling us a little bit about the day of the Lord, phase one, but the chapter's about phase two, return of Jesus Christ to rise up, right, and defend Jerusalem. That's what I used to think. I used to say the overflowing scourge is unleashed and it is the same thing as the winnowing fan during the battle of the great day of God Almighty that starts at the seventh bowl. That's what I've always said. I was wrong. This overflowing scourge is not the winnowing fan. This overflowing scourge of Isaiah 28 is the hired razor flying the bee of Isaiah 7 and 8 and Amos 8 that shall shave like a hired razor as it passes through and passes over. All right. So that's what I always got wrong. Please forgive me. The Lord will rise up is not talking about Father coming and bringing Jesus. This, the Lord will rise up, is Father coming the first time, mentioned in Hosea 5, to start the sixth seal, day of the Lord, or days of the coming of the Son of Man. This day that shall come like a thief, and suddenly, quickly, in an instant, all right, this day that shall come like a thief is begins at the sixth seal. And Father comes by himself. And he, in here in verse 21 of Isaiah 28, he decides to word it like this. Instead of just saying, I will, I will come and, and uh, I will bring uh, the sword against them, and then I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense, which he says in Hosea 5, which I'll take you to to get the, the real wording of it instead of my paraphrasing. But the fact that the Lord is saying, I will rise up in judgment against Judah and Ephraim, that's the part that I was getting wrong. And, and you're going to see in Isaiah 29, the next chapter, and Joel 2, you're going to see this. And this, Joel 2 and Isaiah 29, is going to prove that this work of the Lord, here in Isaiah 28, called his awesome work, his unusual act. This is not talking about the seventh bull return of Father as he brings Jesus to defend Jerusalem, right? To gather to Jesus all that belongs to him, to the bringing of in of his kingdom, you know, coming as a redeemer. No, this, Isaiah 29 and Joel 2 proves, this is his marvelous work. This is his wondrous work. All right, don't, don't, and don't confuse the word wondrous with wonderful. This is not a wonderful time. But it's going to be unusual, awesome. In other words, this is um, the start to the days of the coming of the Son of Man. This is the start to the day of the Lord of Hosts. This is when the cosmic disturbances and earthquakes begin. 
That's what's meant by awesome work and unusual act. And again, in Joel 2 and Isaiah 29, the next chapter, you see it worded like his marvelous work, his wondrous work. In other words, it's describing all of the day of the Lord, phase one, six seal through the end of the sixth bowl, and phase two, battle of the great day of God Almighty, when Jesus is acting, when Jesus is here and acting like a redeemer, bringing in his kingdom after Israel is done having their sins and iniquities and transgressions purged away and uh, taken away their dross and alloy when that's over and we have a clean israel then jesus will be brought by father jesus the father returns that's you know the seventh bowl now he brings jesus and jesus shall rise up against his enemies okay but this is this lord will rise up which i always got wrong this is father coming the first time okay and if you need proof of that, uh, Hosea 5 is a wonderful place to go. It's talking about the day of the Lord. It's talking about the trampling, trampling of Ephraim and Judah, just like Isaiah 28, 29, and Joel 2 is. Okay, Isaiah 7 and 8, remember, within 65 years, Ephraim shall be trampled, broken, and shattered. Isaiah 7. Yes, that's a prophecy for the final day of the Lord of hosts, which no one realizes about Isaiah 7. They notice the Emmanuel, the Emmanuel prophecy in Isaiah 7, but they never notice that within 65 years, Ephraim shall be trampled and broken and shattered. Nobody ever realizes that's a future prophecy yet to be fulfilled talking about the day of the Lord. Now, you might say, well, brother, you just blew my mind on that. What does within 65 years mean? I don't know. But within 65 years, that it is done of Revelation 16, 17 can be screened before the throne, just as Father's coming back a second time, bringing Jesus. I don't know if you count it from 1948 and say within A.D. 2032, uh, the seventh, the day of the Lord, phase one will be over. I mean, that would be a guess, but I don't know. Only Father knows. But within 65 years of something, the seventh bowl will be poured. But we know Hosea 6 says, after two days, I will revive you. 2,000 years from when he left the first time. So I don't know. Now, if you ask me, does that mean that 2032 is, uh, there's at least a small chance that that could be the day the seventh bowl is poured? I would say, yeah, there's at least a, a small chance, but no man knoweth. All right, don't let that scare you off staying for the rest of this study of the day of the Lord. You're going to get a lot out of this, and I apologize for any wrong understanding I've given in the past. So, yes, Hosea 5 is the place that really opened my eyes about Father coming the first time to orchestrate the day of the Lord and the start to the cosmic disturbances and the earthquake and putting the hook in the jaw of Gog the Assyrian to bring him against the land in Daniel 1140 B. Uh, but I never, well anyways, before we go back to Isaiah 28, um, see this right here? I will return again to my place. This is God talking. Don't think of it as Jesus talking. This is God talking. I will return again to my place till they, Ephraim and Judah, acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Okay? Don't think of this chapter as a past event. You're going to miss the future fulfillment. That is so important. Okay? Impending judgment on Israel and Judah. This is at the time of the end. At least the future fulfillment of it is. Okay? But it's real important. We're talking about the day of the Lord, that day spoken of by all the prophets. I will pour out my wrath on them like water. See? Like a flood. Like water. This is it. Okay? It's time to remove Israel's dross and alloy. Clean her up before the kingdom can come. Right, so Father is saying, see, I will take them away and no one shall rescue. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for showing that to me before I left Hosea 5. Do you see that? 
All right, you go to Matthew 24. The flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. And I made the same mistake everyone else did. I thought, oh, this is Jesus' is appearing at the seventh bowl. And Jesus will, with his reaping angels and armies of heaven, to include the ten kings, will pass over in judgment at the seventh bowl, phase two of the day of the Lord. Absolutely. Right? But also will the coming of the Son of Man be. But this is talking about phase one to the days of the coming of, of the Son of Man. Phase one is Israel gets judged first. Remember, that's what we were told in Jeremiah 25. Judgment on the nations. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, its kings and its princes, to make them a desolation and an astonishment, a hissing and a curse, as it is this day. This is phase one to the day of the Lord, the days of the coming of the Son of Man. That day that comes like a thief with sudden and instant destruction upon the land. All right. This is phase one. And then see all these nations. This is phase two when Jesus comes. And you might say, where's America on the list? Well, I could show you uh, Babylon. It's right here. Baghdad, the land of Shinar, the land of the Chaldeans, Shushak, gets to Babylon, Babylon will fall last. And you might say, well, where's America? We have a lot of sinners in America. When do we get judged? Uh, right here. All the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are on the face of the earth. So we get judged right before Baghdad does, which is saved for last. Okay. So all of these are getting judged at the hand of Jesus after his coming. Do you see that? But it begins with the judgment on Israel, which is phase one to the day of the Lord right here. And yes, Egypt's going to get damaged during phase one as well. Okay. This is phase one to the day of the Lord. This I will be like a lion to Ephraim. And, and it will tear them, and I will, see, I will tear them and go away. I will take them, and no one shall rescue. I will return to my place until, what? Ephraim is broken and shattered, and the power of the holy people shall be broken and shattered. Okay. And then they shall seek me in their affliction, and th that means they're clean. That doesn't mean they've all bowed to Jesus. Okay. But Father will consider Israel's dross and alloy purged away by the end of phase one, which ends at the end of the sixth bowl. Okay. Now, what, what the mistake I was making, besides not paying enough attention to Hosea 5, the mistake I was making was here, thinking that anytime I saw this, it was a seventh bowl event appearing of Jesus Christ. That's where I made my mistake. This is the Lord will rise up as Father coming, just like we saw in Hosea 5 during the day of the Lord, when it's time to trample Ephraim and Judah in the last days at the appointed time of the end. The end has come upon my people. This is the start to the day of the Lord when Father comes without Jesus and he orchestrates the start to the day of the Lord of hosts, beginning with the judgment upon his people. And then he'll worry about everyone else when he comes back and brings his son. And I used to think uh, this, this always meant the battle of the great day of God Almighty. See, I thought the moon didn't turn into blood until the seventh bowl. But we're going to see when we go to Isaiah 29 and Joel 2, oh no, this, is, this means the entire day of the Lord, phase 1 and phase 2. All these desolations that are determined that Daniel 9 talks about, okay? All right? And don't forget, uh, Isaiah 14 told us, Isaiah 14, the fall of Lucifer, tells us what's going to happen to America, 
during this battle of the great day of God Almighty, which is phase two to the day of Lord, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Let's, let's read that again, verse 17. Who made Israel a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Who made Babylon a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Who made the Middle East a, a wilderness and destroyed its cities? That's not what it says, does it? The world. A wilderness talking about Lucifer all right and you might say well father had to sign off on it I wouldn't disagree with you father is casting Satan to earth for a reason not to Pluto father's orchestrating this but Lucifer shall be the one shall make the world a wilderness using the Antichrist army which will be the size of 200 million by the sixth trumpet. It'll grow, grow, grow. Okay. So that gives you an idea about America. So yeah, the Lord will rise up. Boy, did I get that wrong and start his unusual act. Awesome work of the Lord beginning with the judgment on Israel first, all right? The trampling of Ephraim and Judah. And, and you know, this always did trouble me when, when any every, anytime I studied Isaiah 28, the way that it starts gives you the, the subject of the chapter. And the subject to the chapter is woe to the enemies of Israel. No, woe to Israel. This is Isaiah 7 and 8. This is Amos 8. Okay? And we know from what else we've read, it's not just the uh, trampling of the drunkards of Ephraim, but it's also the trampling of Judah. Okay? So this is not their Redeemer coming. All right? And then when I, but when I read this, do you see this? This is the flood of Matthew 24, in case you're wondering. All right? The flood that shall take them, Ephraim and Judah, all right? Not only take them, but we know the world eventually will be a wilderness and few men are left. So it's not just the taking away of Israel. It's a taking away of the majority of the people on the planet. We hope by the time it's over, it won't all, not everyone's going to die at the sixth seal. It's a process from the sixth seal through the end of the sixth bowl. And that's judgment on Israel. The wrath shall come upon this people, right? But the seventh bowl battle of the great day of God Almighty, when Jesus is here casting out all who offend, casting out means killing, in case you didn't know that. You're cast out of the land of the living. Get out of my kingdom. But I always thought this was the return of Jesus Christ. As soon as I see the Lord and hail, and tempest, and the flood of mighty waters. Guess which chapter in Revelation I always thought this was talking about? The seventh bowl passage of Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21. That's what I always likened this verse to, too. But I was wrong. Yes, the seventh bowl is the seventh bowl. And it'll be worse than the events of the, of, of the rest of the day of the Lord. It'll be worse than the six seal event. It'll be worse than the six trumpet event. You know, these cosmic signs and, and disturbances and uh, earthquakes shall go on throughout the day of the Lord. But I always thought this was phase two return of Jesus. It's not. This is the Lord rising up to start his unusual act to bring about the day of the Lord. And it shall be like a flood that shall take away. And guess what? Who, guess what? And who Father is using as the sword portion of the promised curse that not only comes upon Israel but affects the entire world. That's why the world should be praying for Israel that they'll pass the fifth seal test, and Father won't need to rise up and bring the promised curse of the Song of Moses. But they're not going to take that opportunity. We should try, but it's not going to work. 
Father's going to bring the curse. Because how could he, how could Father leave the majority of people alive today and still have the kingdom of Jesus? You couldn't. There's too much evil in the world. But this is not the seventh bowl. This is the sixth seal start to the day of the Lord when Father brings not only uh, cosmic disturbances and earthquakes, especially to the land of Israel, but he, he brings the sword portion of the cur curse, which is the Antichrist army. And they shall overflow, the Bible says, the banks of the Euphrates River like a flood. We're talking about a hired razor flying the bee army. We're talking about millions of people attacking Israel all at the same time. They even come from places down the Nile River Basin, North Africa, Turkey, Iran, maybe even Russia, I don't know, Syria, Iraq, Gaza, maybe even Saudi Arabia. Here they come, okay? And it's going, this army is going to be like a flood of water overflowing. But it's not real water. Who will, but there will be storms and hail and uh, Cat 5 Medicanes coming out of the Mediterranean Sea. So there'll be plenty of water, but it's like a flood of many waters. See, there's going to be storms, but the amount of... Of this locust army, the amount of soldiers in this locust-like locust-like army will be uh, like a flood overflowing the banks of the Euphrates rivers coming out of the north. Remember Jeremiah, the early chapters of Jeremiah. What do you see, Jeremiah? Right, this boiling pot coming out of the north. They're going to overflow the banks of the Euphrates River, and you might say, "Well, I thought some of them come from Africa." They do. They do. Okay. They join in on it. Then the Assyrian alliance helps and guards the children of Lot, says Psalm 83. They're both the same war. There's not a war that Israel wins before this one. The next war is this. And the abomination of desolation at the fifth seal will prove it. And everybody will be like, oh my goodness, I thought there was going to be a Psalm 83 war before the Ezekiel 38 war. Well, guess what? They're the same war. And you say, but the countries don't line up. Sure they do. Psalm 83, one verse, I think it's verse 8, says the Assyrian alliance will help and guard the children of Lot. Well, all of those ver uh, nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 is the Assyrian alliance. And then you get some more nations mentioned in Psalm 83 that are being helped and guarded by that great Assyrian alliance. And then you get other uh, passages like Isaiah 7 and 8 and Isaiah 11 that add to the number of nations. And you get the full list. Here they come. But when it says coming out of the north, that's talking about the Assyrian alliance, not the entire Antichrist army, just the, the portion that has most of the weaponry, not necessarily the amount of foot soldiers, but the primary mighty weaponry that Father will use against his own people initially, then against the rest of the world. Well, excuse me, I got to get, I got to be careful here because phase two, all right, is Jesus coming? He's done using, Father's done using the Antichrist army after the sixth bowl. But at the sixth trumpet, the Antichrist army will, Israel's already decimated. They're going to go out and try to take over the world at the sixth trumpet. That's when they turn the world into a wilderness. Like America. I'm not saying we're going to necessarily fall. I have no idea. All right, because I believe and I hope that America is part of the ten king armies that turn against the beast at the seventh trumpet after the strong delusion of the 42 months has been pulled by Father. All right, so yeah, this is not the return of Jesus. I thought it was. I apologize. Okay, there's going to be plenty of hail at the seventh bowl. You could see that in Revelation 16, 17 through 21. But the hail doesn't start pouring 
it may be bigger size at the return of Jesus at the seventh bowl, but there's going to be lots of hail. Might not be as size of a talent, but these cosmic disturbances are going to start at the sixth seal. You can call this the tempest and medium size hail and destroying storms like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, right? Remember what we read in Hosea 5. This start to the day of the Lord will be like a flood that takes them away. Okay, don't forget, don't neglect the book of Hosea. Father will rise up and tear Ephraim and Judah. Do you see this? This is not their Redeemer coming. Ephraim. See, I will rise up. Look at this. This is the Antichrist army being used by Father as a sword coming upon the land of Israel. But the Lord is saying in Isaiah 28, right? I shall rise up. And then here in Hosea 5, He's, he not only says he's going to rise up, but he says, I'm going to be like a lion to Ephraim in the house of Judah. I, right? This is Joel 2 lingo. My great army, which I shall send among them. Right? This is Father using the Antichrist army as the sword portion of the curse. And man, that's hard to say. And it's hard to agree. It's hard to come into agreement on that because it just doesn't sound right, right? We don't want to give strength to the Antichrist. We don't want to try to act like Father and Satan are one going out to perform this work, okay? But you got to take your time and read the Bible. And you'll see Father is saying, I'm the one rising up. I'm the one that's going to trample. That Satan is not me. Satan, is, I'm going to destroy Satan. I'm going to put him in chains when I'm done using him. And then at the great white throne judgment, I'm going to destroy him. But Father, just like he's used king, evil kings like King Nebuchadnezzar, King Sennacherib, however you want to pronounce that name. All right. Father uses evil people to, to perform his work in chastisement against his people. He's done it for thousands of years. So don't let this totally blow your mind that Father rises up to trample the house of Judah in Ephraim and he uses Satan possessing the man of sin to lead an army against his people. So don't let that blow your mind and please don't think I'm speaking blasphemy. I'm trying to sh give you understanding, and I apologize for getting some of this wrong. All right? This is Father rising up against Israel. All right? He's going to send an army, says Joel 2, a great army, and Father's claiming responsibility. I, And then Father says, when I'm done using them to purge away and take away your dross and alloy, O Israel, then their dead bodies and the animals that they bring with them to fight against Jerusalem shall be used as substance to feed Israel, the starving Israelis, when Jesus comes. Then it'll be time to plunder those who plundered my people. So Father's taking responsibility. He's saying he's going to rise up and come against his people. Now, this isn't Jesus. Father doesn't bring Jesus until the seventh bowl. So here, don't think of Jesus when it says, you know, the Lord shall rise up and I will pour out my wrath on them like the water. Okay. Remember, there's other verses and other chapters in the Bible that says this is the wrath upon this people. That's what phase one of the day of the Lord is. It's the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people, like I've always said. All right. So. The Lord will rise up, right? That was verse 21. Was it Isaiah 28? Yes. The Lord will rise up. And I, I would read verses like this and think, oh, this is a match to the verses that say the Lord will go forth and fight as in the day of battle, 
right? Like Zechariah 9, Zechariah 14. Well, that is talking about uh, now it's time to bring Jesus, right? And now it's time to come against the enemies of Israel. But this is phase one. This is Father coming alone the first time. This is not a match to the Lord shall go forth and fight as in the day of battle. That's not the match to this. This is Father starting the day of the Lord. This is Father, rise, Almighty God, rising up to come against his people to begin this marvelous, wondrous act of all these cosmic signs and disturbances and famines and pestilence and plagues that are coming upon Israel and judgments, right? That's Father purging away their dross and alloy of, uh, mentioned in Isaiah 1. This is what Matthew 24 is talking about. The flood that will take you, that we all for years thought, oh, that's the rapture. We just weren't sure when it happens, but that's talking about the rapture, right? Judgment day, when Jesus sits to judge the living and the dead. That's not what that's talking about. Yes, it's God rendering his judgment, but that's not Jesus sitting to judge the living and the dead. That's not what this is. All right, and you say, what well, says, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. I hear you, but it's the start to the days of the coming of the Son of Man. See, now it all makes sense because we know it's a post-trib uh, rapture at the same time as the resurrection to life, right? At the appearing of Jesus Christ at the seventh bowl, the last day, we always knew that. But then we tried to make this be the rapture, see? We tried to say that, well, the flood is the rapture, and verse 40 is the rapture, and verse 41 is the rapture. That's what we used to try to say. But it never did sound right to us. Like, how can it be a seventh bowl rapture, but yet these people are taken by surprise? Well, what, the reason why we went astray for centuries, church, is because we didn't understand what the flood is. The flood is the flood of Isaiah 28, 29, Joel 2, Hosea 5. All right? That's what the flood is. All right? Remember the way that Isaiah 28 begins? Like a flood of mighty waters overflowing. And you come down to here and it says it's going to take them. All right. It will take you, verse 19. Remember that it will take you in verse <coughs> in uh, Hosea 5. Okay. So that's what Matthew 24's flood is that will take you and take you by surprise. All right, so this day of the Lord comes at the sixth seal, and it will result in over half of the planet not being alive by the time the battle of the great day of God is over. And you might say, I thought we were talking about the day of the Lord. Well, battle of the great day of God Almighty is phase two to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord doesn't end at the end of the sixth bowl. That's just phase one. <coughs> this day... This unusual act, this marvelous, wondrous, strange, awesome day of the Lord will not end until Jesus is done casting out all offense. But he doesn't even come until the seventh bowl battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's when Father comes a second time and rises up a second time and brings his son. But this is the first time Father is rising up. Okay. This is the sudden destruction at noonday. The end has come upon my people. So a lot of this, which does affect the entire world, we saw that in Isaiah 14 and Jeremiah 25, but it starts with this flood initially coming upon the land of Israel. That's Daniel 11:40b, the passing through of the man of sin possessed by Satan. Okay? And remember, there's not going to be anyone left in the boundaries of Israel except the 10% holy stump, which is primarily women and children, mentioned in uh, Isaiah 4 and Isaiah 6. 
That's what this means. This is taking away Israel. Two-thirds of Israel is about to die, says Zechariah 13. The other one-third will be in slavery. There'll be no one left in the of Israelis uh, in except for a few inhabitants in the city of Jerusalem who are under siege at the time Jesus appears, says Zechariah 14. But the vast majority of Israelis are either dead or in slavery. Okay, But it happens suddenly in an instant at the sixth seal. This has absolutely nothing, even though it has a lot to do with the coming of the Son of Man, it has nothing to do with the rapture. The rapture is real. That's the gathering to Jesus of all belongs to him at his appearing on the last day. That's to start phase two of the day of the Lord. But this is talking about phase one and how it will start with this flood. Remember, Jeremiah, what do you see, Jeremiah? What do you see coming out of the north? When's it going to happen? What do you see? I see an almond blossom. Mm, summer is near. Summer is near. The leaves are coming on the fig tree. Summer is near. Okay? This has nothing to do with a rapture. People leaving the planet. This is the flood. And there's the flood that's coming. Now, there are verses uh, like Nahum 1 that talks about the seventh bowl flood. And that's that stream of fire and brimstone that reaches up to the neck. All right. Don't confuse the seventh bowl stream of fire of, of, of brimstone that reaches up to the neck. Don't confuse that flood of fire with the flood of the Antichrist army. I hope you caught what I just said, brothers and sisters. It'll help you tremendously. There's two different floods. Okay, during the day of the Lord, there's the phase one flood and there's the phase two flood. But both floods will involve lots of whirlwinds, tempests, storms, earthquakes, and hail. But the hail gets bigger as you get towards the appearing of Jesus Christ at the seventh bowl. All right. The hail starts when the Lord rises up to perform his unusual act. Bringing the overflowing scourge, hired razor, flying the bee, which I got it wrong all those years. That's not the winnowing fan of the seventh bowl, right? When you have the wind, but you also have the streams of fire and brimstone coming out of the nostrils of Jesus Christ, riding on the swift clouds on his white horse, which is the cherub of Ezekiel chapter one. But anyways, yeah, the seventh bowl flood is this. Now, see, all of the day of the Lord is the days of vengeance. And I always got that wrong, too, because I always said, hey, when Jesus shows up, that's the day of vengeance. You know, like uh, spoken of in Revelation 19, he will come with vengeance on his enemies. I thought that was the day of vengeance, the day of recompense, the day of punishment. Well, it is on his enemies. And that's what this is. But I, but my point is, the, all of the day of the Lord is the days of vengeance, the days of the coming of the Son of Man, the day of the Lord of hosts, wrath upon this people, you know, phase one. But it's all the days of vengeance. But this is Jesus being brought by Father. This is the reserved wrath on his enemies. Okay. Now, he has enemies in Israel, too. That's why two-thirds of Israel is about to die. They cannot be permitted to enter into his kingdom. Okay, The Lord has his way in the whirlwind, and in the storm, and in the clouds are the dust of his feet, and he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. Of course, here we're talking about the bowls of wrath. All right. But this is um, the world and all who dwell in it. Okay, this is talking about phase two. Here, of course, is uh, actually starts during the bowls of wrath, darkness pursuing his enemies. I think that's the fifth bowl. All right.
Now this, of course, is uh, ta talking a little bit about phase one, right? From Mozoirak, Nineveh, comes the wicked counselor, the vile one of Daniel eleven twenty one. This is the Antichrist, man of sin. He it says, will he come forth from uh, Mosul? Well, that's where the peace agreement will be signed, and he shall rise to power at that time. But he comes forth from Magog. I don't know where that is, but I think it's up there near Mount Ararat. But this is where he shall arise to power. Okay. You are vile. See, this is this is the match to Daniel eleven twenty one. All right. Then comes Jesus. So, you can see how there was quite a bit that I had gotten wrong. There's two floods. And I used to say that. I used to get that right. But I didn't realize that Isaiah 28's overflowing scourge is, that will go out and pass over and take you. I used to say that. <laughs> <clears throat> that occurs at the seventh bull return of Jesus. But no, the overflowing scourge happens about three years before Jesus' winnowing fan. This is the Antichrist of 11, uh, Daniel 1140b coming, overflowing the banks of the Euphrates River like a flood of mighty water, coming upon Israel. That's what Isaiah 28 is all about. So let's go to... Um, the PNG file that I created for you to show you how it helped me realize my mistake. All right, here we go. We're going to com combine, compare Isaiah 29 to Joel 2. Uh, what do I have at the top? Understanding the two phases to the coming day of the Lord, six seal through the end of the battle of the great day of God Almighty, using a new King James Version Bible. If you rather use a King James Version Bible, that's fine. They're almost identical. I like the New King James Version better because it helps me uh, uh, determine uh, by capitalizations when we're talking about the Lord and when we're not. Uh, by using Isaiah 29 and Joel 2 and color coding. Okay, so I hope this helps. The red and orange is phase one. Verses that pertain to phase one of the day of the Lord. Six seal through the end of the sixth bowl. But you got to make sure you understand that, and this, and I wrote this for me too. There's mention of tempest doesn't always mean the second northern army, which is the ten kings being used by Father after Jesus appears to turn against the beast. My point is, cosmic signs and wonders are starting at the sixth seal. In other words. Father doesn't wait until he comes back the second time, bringing Jesus at the seventh bowl to start these wondrous whirlwinds and tempests and medicanes and earthquakes. Father begins them at the sixth seal when he rises up against his own people the first time. And then, of course, like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, these cosmic signs and wonders and earthquakes will increase in intensity until Father comes back the second time at the seventh bowl and brings Jesus, okay? And then all who belong to Jesus will be gathered to him at that time. That's the wheat uh, gathering to the barn at the seventh bowl. Tempest and the first northern army. Again, the Antichrist army, the Assyrian alliance portion of it, which has most of the military equipment, Overflow, it overflows the banks of the Euphrates River like a flood. But don't forget, this is the hired razor army of the Antichrist, which combines not only the Assyrian alliance that shall be formed, but also many other nations in, in uh, Northeast Africa. Okay. And uh, this is the uh, the red and orange verses are the overflowing scourge flood of Isaiah 28 too. Okay. But um, phase two, which you see now, Joel 2 is not phase two and Isaiah 29 phase one. Okay, it kind of looks like that on this PNG file, but that's not my what I'm trying to show you here. 
I'm just, I just happened to put phase two, uh, or I should say, I just happened to put Joel two on this side of the page, which happens to be under the purple. But I'm not saying Joel two is phase two. No, Joel three is phase two. But I'm just, I, you know, I had to put it on there somewhere. So go by the colors of the verses. All right. The purple color is Isaiah 17, 12. And this is Father going to stop the noise of the military powers coming against Israel. So at the seventh bowl, Father puts a stop to their noise. And, in, and, and now you're going to have the noise of his, my sanctified ones, and his, my mighty ones, which are the ten kings who turn against the beast. The my sanctified ones are all the armies of heaven. All right, now it's time for Jesus to make some noise with his armies and reaping angels and storms and earthquakes and 100 pound hail. All right, so Father's going to stop the Antichrist noise by bringing the noise of Jesus and his armies of heaven and the 10 kings. All right, but Joel 2, so you know, is. Uh, in the red and orange is phase one. And then when you get down to uh, verse 18 of Joel 2, you start talking about phase two. Okay. But then the it, uh, here you see um, in these red boxes, uh, Father's talking about the entire day of the Lord. You'll see. All right. Isaiah 29 verses 1 through 24. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. See, so here we are. This is talking about the woe on Israel to the house of Judah, the trampling of Ephraim. All right. So this starts out like Isaiah 28 does. In other words, it's talking about phase one, the judgment upon Israel, and they get judged first. This is not the Redeemer coming to Israel. And year to year, let feast come around. Yet, I, I, this is Father saying, it's the same thing you see down here in uh, uh, Joel 2, when he, right here in verse uh, 25, when he says, My great army, which I sent among you. Father's, you know, saying, yep, I, I bear responsibility for, for bringing the Antichrist upon you. All right, this is what Father is saying in Isaiah 29. I will distress Ariel. There shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be to me as Ariel. I will encamp against you all around. This is this that Lord will rise up, right? In Isaiah 28, I will encamp against you. He's going to use the Antichrist army possessed by Satan to do it. I will lay, lay siege against you with a mound. I will raise siege works against you. Talk about Jerusalem. You shall be brought down. You shall speak out of the ground. Your speech shall be low out of the dust. Your voice shall be like a medium's out of the ground, and your speech shall whisper out of the dust. Moreover, the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust. All right. In other words, you can't even number the name of the number of the army that's coming against you. They are just it's amazing. The sheer amount of bodies, the multitude of the terrible ones like chaff that passes away. Yes, it shall be in an instant suddenly. See, I used to think that was talking about phase two, seventh bowl, the return of Jesus being brought by father. Right. Because we know Jesus tells us in a. Uh, Revelation 16, 15, that he's coming quickly. I thought this was the seventh bowl quickly returning of Jesus Christ when he had quickly attacks his enemies. But no, this is Father rising up quickly, suddenly in an instant to bring the end upon his people of Amos 8 and Isaiah 7 and 8. And, and uh, Daniel eleven forty, the time of the end has come upon my people. Well, this is Father rising up in judgment against Jerusalem, just like Jeremiah 25 said. He, they're going, he's going to start with Israel. You, who? Jerusalem. You will be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake and a great noise. That noise has to do with an army, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. See, I used to think that was describing the return of Jesus at the seventh bowl. 
against his enemies. But no, this is Father dealing with his people. This is the flood of Matthew 24. The multitude of the nations who fight against it, Ariel. That's the noise part. Even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when a hungry man dreams and looks, he eats, but he awakes and his soul is still empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams and looks, he drinks and he awakes, and indeed he is faint and his soul still craves. So the multitude of the nations shall be who fight against Mount Zion. Pause and wonder, blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. Who's he talking about? The drunkards of Ephraim and the house of Judah, right? Not understanding during the fifth seal and the sixth seal when it's not understanding what's going on. What's happening? I thought we had a peace agreement. Yeah, right. But not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep. It's called strong delusion. And has closed your eyes, namely the prophets. You all don't have a clue what's going on. You think the Antichrist is your Messiah. And he has covered your heads, this is God, namely the seers. And the whole vision has become to you, talking to Israel and their leadership and their prophets, like the words of a book that is sealed. You have, In other words, you, you didn't understand what the Christians were trying to warn you about. Which men deliver to one who is illiterate, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I cannot. In other words, Father is saying, You won't have a clue that I'm bringing the day of the Lord upon you. I'm bringing the day of the Lord, and the first part is going to be upon you. And you're not going to see it coming. It's going to be a surprise. But Christians with understanding, they shall watch. And they shall not let uh, their households be broken into by the thief. Okay. They're not going to let their family members take the mark of the beast because they're going to be teaching them in advance. But you, O oh Israel, it's going to take you like a surprise. All right. Verse 13, therefore, when the Lord says that, he's getting ready to tell you what he's going to do. What's the result of the sin? Here he comes, how he's going to deal with sin. Therefore, the Lord said, in so much as these people, remember the verses that say the wrath shall come upon this people, talking about Israel, his own people, draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. They just pay me lip service, basically, is what he's saying. And their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. We know Israel's children, just like our own children, they don't fear God. Therefore, here we go, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, and a marvelous work and a wonder. See, when I read that before, I used to think, oh, wow, that's the serious stuff that happens when Jesus appears. You know, the hundred pound hail and all that. No, this is talking about the entire day of the Lord, starting back at the sixth seal, when the Antichrist army overflows the bank of the Euphrates River like a flood to take away the precious children of Israel. All right. Therefore, I will again, this is the Lord rising up against the house of Judah and the drunkards of Ephraim. I will again do a marvelous work among this people. Here goes the cosmic signs and wonders. A marvelous work and a wonder, not wonderful, wondrous. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. They're going to start persecuting the Christians who are trying to warn them that the Antichrist is possessed by Satan and not their Messiah. But they won't understand. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord. Remember the peace agreement that will be signed in Mosul? And their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us and who knows us? Surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say to, of him who made it? He did not make me. You know, basically saying there's no God or there, Jesus is not real. Who, 
Or shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, he has no understanding? And Jesus does understand what Father's up to. He tried to warn Israel. Verse 17, is it not yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field? So see, this is the New King James Version folks put future recovery of wisdom. They added that part. Verse 17 starts saying, you know, giving hope, saying, hey, but it's, you know, this, this day of the Lord's only going to last a very little while. And then comes uh, the kingdom of God and things are going to get really, really good. So in other words, don't lose hope, Israel. There's going to be a time when the whole Middle East is going to be turned slowly over process of years into the Garden of Eden. It is not yet a very little while. Of course, we know from Isaiah 16 prophecy of Jordan's punishment that the day of the Lord is going to last within three years. And you might say, well, I thought it was three and a half years. Well, three and a half years is going back to Daniel 11:36 when Satan arrives. 30 days following the abomination of desolation event in Jerusalem, Daniel 11:36. That's when the 42 months begins. That's, when, that's how long Christians have to put up with Satan being here and being able to uh, work signs, wonders, and miracles and to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's the 42 months that's starting at Daniel 11.36. But Daniel 11.40b starts the day of the Lord when this hired razor overflowing scourge shall pass through the land beginning with judging Israel. Now, do they think they're doing the job of Yah, the Holy One of Israel, for him? No. The man of sin is being used by Father, but he doesn't think that he's honoring Father. No. He thinks he's God. So, I hope I didn't confuse you there. So, where do we leave off at? Um, verse 18. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of the book, talking about after Jesus returns and after the battle of the great day of God Almighty is over and you're having the early days of the millennium during Jesus' kingdom. That's what verses 17 and 18 are talking about. And the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice. So that doesn't happen at the sixth seal. That's after the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So the Lord is just throwing verses 17, 18, and 19 in there to give you some hope of how it's all going to end. Now look what it says in verse 20. Now he's getting back to the details. For the terrible one is brought to nothing. I color-coded that purple. Why? Because that's phase two of the day of the Lord when Jesus is brought by a father. Now Jesus is leading his armies to cast out all who offend and who came against his people during phase one. For the terrible one is brought to nothing. The scornful one is consumed. So either that's just two ways, two titles of the Antichrist possessed by Satan, or that means one is identifying the Antichrist and the other one is identifying the false prophet. I don't know which one of those two choices is correct. If I was to guess, I would say the terrible one is the Antichrist and the scornful one is the false prophet. Is consumed and all who watch for the iniquity are cut off. Okay. Now this doesn't, this isn't, this watch here is not talking about Christians of understanding watching the events unfold and understanding that the day of the Lord is coming. That's not the ones who are doing the watching here. This is the ones who watch for iniquity. In other words, sinners who are always looking to do evil. That's what that means. They're cut off when Jesus appears at the seventh bowl, cut off from the land of the living. Who make a man as a fender by a word and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. And turn aside the just by empty words. So he's just describing all the evil people who are going to meet their fate at the seventh bowl. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. Jacob shall not now be ashamed, not after Jesus appears, 
after Israel is done being having their sins and iniquities purged away and taken away, nor shall his face grow now grow pale. And you might say, well, how many people of Israel is going to be alive when Jesus comes back? Well, Zechariah 13 tells us, one third. They'll be in slavery and their Redeemer will set them free. Now there'll be a few in, uh, in Jerusalem under siege. There'll be a few, mainly women and children, hiding in some of the clefts of the rock. But the two-thirds of Israel is going to die. One-third will be into slavery. Um, These also who erred in spirit will come to understanding, and those who complain will learn doctrine. What That's kind of important. Verse 24 is telling you there's going to be mortal Israelis left alive who will be told to come back to Jerusalem and live there and help rebuild the cities and rebuild the not rebuild, build the fourth temple. The third temple will be de- totally destroyed. Build the fourth temple. All right, build the city. So my point is this. I've, I've heard great men of God recently, some of them talk about how all of these people dwelling in Jerusalem are all incorruptible. These people dwelling with Jesus in Jerusalem are all incorruptible bodies. They're not mortals. That's not true. And this verse 24 proves it, okay? There's going to be one-third of Israel who are foolish virgins. Now, there'll be some among them who are Christians who will be transfigured at Jesus' return. But a lot of these one-third of Israelis, they're mark-free, but they really don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. So they don't get transfigured. But they're going to learn understanding and learn doctrine during the teachings of Jesus during the millennium. And at the great white throne judgment, many of them will be changed. But don't say that mortals aren't, mortal Israelis aren't going to be living with Jesus and be part of his kingdom. So you got to get that right. That one third of Israel going into slavery, that's going to be under the yoke that will be freed when their Redeemer comes. Okay, so it's not a, don't think of the earth as being full, 100% full of immortals when Jesus is done doing all these things. No, there's going to be a lot of people left alive in their mortal bodies, but none of them have the mark of the beast. Isaiah 66, verses 18 through 21 is a great place to go. I even have it right here to see there's going to be people left alive on all seven continents to include to include Israelis who are mortals, right? They're not being transfigured, going to be brought to Jesus and, and be his people and help uh, do the work and to supervise uh, the peoples of the nations who came against them, who are left a small and feeble remnant, will be forced, forced labor at first, and then they'll come to be to realize how blessed they are to serve Jesus. They'll, they'll realize that they're not necessarily serving their Israeli masters, but they're actually serving the Lord by doing work, and they'll be blessed and, and, and actually eventually feel like they're part of God's family. Okay. All right, enough about that. Now let's see how Joel 2 can be matched up with Isaiah 29 so we understand that this yellow and red verses are actually the first phase of the day of the Lord. Okay, so when you match these up, you'll realize that the it shall be in an instant suddenly. That's not the quickly return of Jesus at the seventh bowl. That's the instant sudden destruction has come upon my people when the Lord God rises up against them at the sixth seal and uses the Antichrist army as the sword portion of the curse. Here we go. Again, brothers and sisters, this is what helped me. Realize that this is not the seventh bowl return of Jesus, which helped me understand Isaiah 28 better. All right, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it, it, is, it is at hand. Sound the trumpet in Zion. What does that mean? Zion is under attack. All right, this is Jeremiah. 
early chapters of Jeremiah, the first six chapters. Look out here. J Jerusalem is under attack. But we're talking about the day of the Lord at the end of the age. For it is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. Is this the darkness at the appearing of Jesus Christ at the seventh bowl? No, this is the start to the cosmic signs. All right, this is, um, uh, well, let's read. You'll see, a people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been. All right, this is the Assyrian alliance helping and guarding the children of, children of Lot with the addition of other nations like Northeast Africa. Nor will there ever be any such after them. So this is not a past attack on Israel. Did you see that? We're talking about the end of the age, even for many successive generations. Why does he throw that in there? Because there is going to be an army like this again, at the end of the millennium, when Satan is released for one last time to draw to him all that belonged to him before we transition into eternity at the end of the millennium. That's why it's worded like that. A fire devours before them and behind them. Do you see that? That's the match right here to verse 6 of Isaiah 29. Flame of a devouring fire. This is another thing that used to give me trouble in my understanding. I thought when I see consume, a consuming fire, a devouring fire, I thought that always meant Jesus is here. And we're talking about the stream of fire and brimstone that comes out of his nostrils of Isaiah 30, the very next chapter, and Isaiah 33. I thought that meant Jesus is here. But no, this is Father rising up against his own people without Jesus. Jesus is still in heaven, all right, at the sixth seal. And this is uh, tr trumpet judgment one, trumpet judgment two, trumpet judgment three, trumpet judgment four. All these uh, trumpet judgments coming upon his people as he's chastising them and removing away their dross and alloy and using the Antichrist army. See, this people who come great and strong, this is not the ten kings turning against the beast of Revelation 17 at the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus. This is the sixth seal, first northern army. I say the first northern army because the ten kings are, are spoken of in Jeremiah chapters 47 through 51, whether you believe it or not, and that they're also called a northern army. That's not this northern army. This is the early first six chapters of Jeremiah and the first ten chapters of Isaiah. This is the first northern army. This is the Antichrist army, and he is possessed by Satan. Here they come. A fire devours before them. Now that fire could be, uh, uh, who knows? That could be sent by Father via exploding volcanoes or incoming meteor strikes, whatever. Or this simply could be rocket fire and cruise missile fires ahead of the actual infantry. It doesn't really matter. And behind them, a flame burns. Everything's on fire as they pass through the land of Daniel 1140b, heading southward from the Euphrates River, or you could even say southwest. So behind them a flame burns, the land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Remember Isaiah 14? Of course, this is the Middle East turning into a desolate wilderness, and we know that by the sixth trumpet, the world will turn into a desolate wilderness. But there'll be people left alive on all seven continents. Surely nothing shall escape them. That's the it will take you, okay? Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds, so they will run with a noise like chariots over the mountaintops they leap. You know, just imagine, you know, thousands of fighting vehicles and tanks, you know, you name it. Uh, artillery, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. This is not some kind of demonic army, so don't let people tell you that. 
All right. Yes, there's going to be plenty of demonic activity, but these are actually real people coming against Israel. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained in color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like a men of war. Everyone marches in formation. So that tells you this isn't just some ragtag army, like, say, a people from Gaza coming over the fence. This is actually military powers, all right? with precise weaponry. They do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro. And they're not, this is not some kind of an immortal army. Don't let that confuse you. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. But they could be getting help from God. What I mean by that is, if Israel tried to send in nukes or something like that ahead of them, tactical nukes, they probably are in that regard. They're probably getting helped by Almighty God because he's saying, this is my army. This is my doing. Yes, it's the Antichrist possessed by Satan. But all of these nations are falling under the spell and they will join in to come against Israel. But don't think that Father's not going to deal harshly with them because Father's going to kill them all when he's done using them to purge away Israel's dross and alloy. He's going to kill them. Even though they're considered his army while this is going on. All right, let's start with uh, verse 9. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter into the windows like a thief. We know that that, see that like a thief, that has to do with towards the end of the siege of Jerusalem. Remember Zechariah 14, same wording, okay? The raping of the Israeli women, especially in Jerusalem. So that's how it's going to, uh, the result of it, right before Jesus returns. They're actually, the wall has been broken down. The Antichrist army is no longer besieging Jerusalem. And by Zechariah 14, they're actually climbing up into the windows and ravishing, raping all the women in Jerusalem. And you might say, well, where's Tel Aviv and Haifa at that point? By the end of the sixth bowl, well, they're already either dead or in slavery, says Zechariah 13. I don't wish it on them. Now watch verse 10. This is more stuff that you can match up with Isaiah 29. The earth quakes before them. This is the cosmic signs that begin at the sixth seal. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness. Okay. That gets a little confusing because when you read that, if you are under the mindset that I was, that all of these signs in the sun, moon, and stars, uh, for the most part, deal with the return of Jesus, no. That's why Isaiah 13 says that the earth will shake during the uh, day of, of the wrath of the Lord and on the day of his fierce anger. See, remember Isaiah 13, verses 9 and 13? That's talking about phase one and phase two, right? Phase one is the wrath of the Lord of host upon his people, or you could say upon this people. And phase two is the day of his fierce anger when now he's done using the Antichrist army. He brings Jesus. Jesus musters his army together at the barn above either Jerusalem or just south of there, above the land of Jerusalem, and he attacks, okay? And now he's the redeemer of what's left of Israel. But yeah, the earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the star. So that, in other words, there's going to be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, um... At the sixth seal. Now, I've always said that they're going to be, but I didn't really stress the start to the cosmic events that grow in intensity like a woman in labor. I never really stressed that. All right. So I got to not be quite so hard on myself. I always said there was signs in the sun and moon, but I never said that they would be the moon would turn into blood. I always said that it's just the fog of war causing the darkness. Right. And that's true. 
But it's important that people know that the, the sun, moon will grow dark, the stars will diminish their brightness, and the, low, um, the sun will be, look right here, let's cheat and go down to the bottom of Joel 2. Look right here in verse 31 of Joel 2. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming and great and awesome day of the Lord. Okay. What I used to say was, see, see the difference between phase one and phase two. I used to say the phase one was the day of the Lord and phase two was the great and awesome day of the Lord phase. And then the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. I, I used to say, hey, that's something that happens at the end of the sixth bowl. But now I realize after matching this up, Joel 2 with Isaiah 29, no, the moon turns into blood at the sixth seal to start the entire day of the Lord. So in other words, if you get that wrong, like I think I did, and you say, hey, there's going to be signs, but when the moon turns into blood, the next thing that happens is the Redeemer, the Messiah, Jesus, comes. See? But now I think I was wrong about that. I think the moon is going to be turned into blood before Father even begins his marvelous and wondrous and unusual act at the sixth seal. You see what damage I can do if I get this wrong, because if you see the moon turn into blood at the end of the fifth seal, and you think the next one who comes is the true Messiah and the Antichrist army comes, you can see how you could steer people wrong. So, yes, Israel is going to get attacked for years before Jesus comes. And I say years because of Isaiah 16. Because in Daniel 11, 40b, when the day of the Lord begins at the passing through the Antichrist army, which is the first northern army, you see Jordan getting out of her punishment. Isaiah 16 says, concerning that, in Daniel 11, Isaiah 16 says, Oh, Jordan, you know, don't think you're getting out of punishment or getting out of judgment. Because when I bring my boy, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Right, Lord God, King of kings and Lord of lords, when I bring him, you shall be punished. And that punishment, I'm paraphrasing, shall come within three years. So that's why I say I think just under three years will be the length of the day of the Lord. Again, with the 42 months period starting four verses earlier in Daniel 11 at verse 36, back in the fifth seal. But anyways... I think the moon's going now I think the moon is going to turn into blood to signify the start of the day of the Lord and that the great and awesome day of the Lord is just another way of saying the day of the Lord. In other words, it's all great, awesome, unusual, dreadful, terrible. See, I used to think those adjectives meant the return of Jesus at the end of the day of the Lord, but now I don't think that because of this study. All right. Getting back up here to verse 10, the earth quakes before them. This is not the 10 kings coming upon the land. This is not at the seventh bowl. This is not Jesus and the armies of heaven or the reaping angels at the seventh bowl. This is this army at the sixth seal, the Antichrist army that Father is taking credit for. Okay? The earth quakes before them. That's this earthquake right here of verse 6 in Isaiah 29. This needs to be taught together. All right, that's this earthquake. All right, so when you go to Revelation 6, six seal passage, all right, let's take a look at that now. And again, this is something that I had gotten wrong. This six seal passage, when it's talking about... Uh, Starting in verse 12, the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. I thought that this was directing our attention to the seventh bowl earthquake mentioned in Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21, which is the greatest earthquake of human history since Adam. That's coming at the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus, right? I thought that is what it was directing us to, but it's not. It's a great earthquake in the Middle East, especially the land of Israel. Okay. And, but it's this earthquake 
that the six seal is talking about. It's this one. The one that quakes as Father is rising up to come against his people using the Antichrist army, which is phase one. See, it's that earthquake, not the greatest earthquake of all time. And see, I saw the heavens tremble again. I'm thinking, ooh, this is the seventh bowl earthquake. No, it's not. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army. This is the same Lord that rises up. Okay, which I always thought that when the Lord rises up, that's Father bringing Jesus and Jesus arises. No, this Lord rises up to perform his unusual act. His Father coming against his people, okay, first, which I knew he came against his people first, but I didn't think of it as Father coming two times. You know, I just, I just, you know, yeah, I thought of it as, it as father putting things in motion, but I never really thought of it as father coming at the sixth seal, returning to his place until they acknowledge his, their offense, and then he comes again at the seventh bowl on the last day, but that time brings Jesus. I didn't really think of it that way. This is the earth, and I used to say the worst earthquake of all times of the seventh bowl comes when they're the present of the presence of Almighty God causes the earth to shake. Well, yes, the presence of God causes the earth to shake, but it happens twice. Okay, it happens at the sixth seal and the seventh bowl. See, Father is here, not Jesus, but Father is here. Orchestrating all of this. And you might say, well, brother, I, I dig what you're saying, but I'm not so sure I like this idea of saying Father's presence comes twice. You got any proof of that? And the answer is yes, it's in Isaiah 13, like I talked about in verses 9 through 13. All right, talking about the destruction of Baghdad, which happens last, remember Jeremiah 25, during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. But parts of Isaiah 13 talks about the entire day of the Lord. And this is a gold mine when we're trying to understand Father's presence being felt twice. Are you with me? This right here? This is proving that when you look at both phases of the day of the Lord, not just phase two and the fall of Babylon, but both phases, Father comes twice. All right? So the day of the Lord comes cruel with both wrath, that's phase one, wrath upon this people, and there's and, that's dividing, phase one and phase two. Phase two is fierce anger, which down here in verse 13 is called the day of his fierce anger, that he unleashes his son, the day that his father brings the kingdom of God and his son to earth, Jesus. All right, see the day of the Lord comes, but watch what it says. Here it is, here's the important one. Therefore I will shake, that's the earthquake, which will affect the clouds and the, and the movement of the earth. I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place. We're talking about the mantle of the earth. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts. See, that's the wrath right here. Verse 9, the wrath of the Lord of hosts, also called the wrath upon this people. All right. So the earth is going to shake in phase one. There it is. There's the and, which divides phase one and phase two. And in the day of his fierce anger, that's when Jesus is here, sitting to judge the living and the dead. Okay? Jesus does not come to judge the living and the dead at the start to the day of the Lord, which comes like a thief at the sixth seal. No, Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead when he's brought by Father, and it is Father's second appearance. But each time Father's presence is felt, uh, you have these two great earthquakes. You've got a great earthquake at the sixth seal. Then you also have a Jerusalem-focused earthquake at the seventh trumpet when the two witnesses arise, 7,000 people die. But then you have the greatest earthquake of all time at the seventh pole when, bowl when Father comes 
back, but this time bringing Jesus. And that's called the day of his fierce anger. But it's all called the days of vengeance. You got it? So back to the PNG file. So the earth quakes before them. Again, that's the match over here. And the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army. And I used to think that was talking about the ten kings who turn against the beast, or talking about the armies of heaven. But it's not. This is the start to the day of the Lord. All right? The Lord gives voice, and he, and he tells you right here. Right? He tells you down, he explains further in verse 25, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Okay. He's talking about the Antichrist army. The, the them, before them, right? Chariots. This army. The Lord gives vo voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one. And I used to think that just simply meant Jesus, one like the Son of Man, but it doesn't. It means the Trinity, God, who executes his word. <coughs> Excuse me. For the day of the Lord, which is the whole thing, both phases, is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? You see that? So, back when I used to think that the great, very terrible day of the Lord simply meant phase two, battle of the great day of God Almighty, when, you know, I used to think that. But now I see that the his army is this army down here in verse 25, which is the locust-like army, which is the Antichrist army. And this says that before... Or, what, or the Lord gives voice before his army. And that that moment, which is the sixth seal, is the start to the very terrible and great day of the Lord. So then I, I had to, when I matched it up with this, Isaiah 29, I had to say, hey, I was wrong. The whole thing is the great and terrible, great and awesome, great and dreadful, great and unusual day of the Lord. The whole thing. But this is talking about phase one. So now verse 12. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. When should they do that? <laughs> Before the end of the fifth seal. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Now, as we read the next verse or two, you need to be thinking of Malachi chapter 4, the last chapter of the entire Old Testament talking about the coming day of the Lord, the warning about it coming on the last generation of Israel, just like the song of Moses promised. But it, it Father is opening the door, and if they'll listen to the two witnesses during the early days of their 42 months of testimony, in other words, during the fifth seal, if they l will listen to them and return to the Lord, Yah, the Holy One of Israel, and His Son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If they would do that, which is what the two witnesses are going to start out warning Israel about during the fifth seal, if they would just listen to Elijah when he comes, this would not all have to go down like this. That's what Father is saying. So rend your hearts and not your garments when they're rolling around in the ashes. Of course, when they're rolling around in the ashes of sackcloth, dressed in sackcloth, at the sixth seal, it's too late. But if they would rend their hearts back at the fifth seal, they would return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents. So that's, that's Malachi 4. When he relents from doing harm, he and he relents. So if you return to him, you don't have to go through the chastisement. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So even though the Bible, the word of God gives us all of these how long countdowns, he tells us all these things, 
and trumpet judgments that are going to befall Israel during the coming curse and how the world's going to become a wilderness. Father is saying, hey, I'm leaving the door open. There's always a little chance that Israel will do the right thing during the fifth seal. In other words, Christians will be successful in warning Israel so that as soon as that man of sin is proclaiming to be God and sets up the abomination of desolation in the third temple, if Christians can be successful in warning Israel and Israel denounces the Antichrist and bows a knee to Jesus in mass, if by some miracle, well, that's what this is saying, I'm leaving the door open and none of those, the curse won't have to come. At the sixth seal, I'll bring Jesus. But don't let the devil cause that information to, to be used against us. In other words, don't tell people that, hey, who knows? Father might relent and he'll bring Jesus at the sixth seal. Don't confuse people. Make sure people understand what it looks like when Father brings Jesus versus what it looks like when Father rises up and uses the Antichrist army against his people. In other words, everyone needs to know how to recognize when the true Messiah comes. When Father rises up to bring Jesus, Jesus comes riding the chair of Ezekiel chapter 1, and it's going to be on fire, and he's coming in the clouds above Jerusalem. But when the Antichrist army comes, it comes out of the north, overflowing the banks of the Euphrates River, and no cherub, no marvelous, wonderful cherub, wondrous cherub is up in the air on fire. No, we're just talking about an army coming out of the north. But we do... When I say things like that, we've got to always remind ourselves that starting back in Daniel 11:36, during the early days of the fifth seal, there's going to be false Christ and false prophets working signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So don't think all of these miracles start at the sixth seal when the cosmic signs begin. No, the miracles, I should say the the Bible words it the uh, false signs and wonders by the false Christ, plural, and the false prophets, plural. All right. I think it's either Mark or Luke tells us that. Mark 13 or Luke 21, there's going to be multiple false Christ. There'll be a man of sin, but there'll be multiple false Christ and multiple false prophets. And they shall work signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. All right, so even though the cosmic signs start at the sixth seal, don't be surprised by all of these miracles worked during the fifth seal by these multiple false Christ and false prophets. Those are the things we should be warning our family about. That's what begins the days of the falling away and turning away from Jesus. And your kids are coming home from college with the mark of the beast. And you're like, oh my Lord, what just happened? What just happened? That's why we have to teach this in church. We have to teach the falling away. We're going to be here for it. Your household's going to be here for it. Your kids are going to come home with the mark and you didn't warn them in time. And this thief is going to come upon your household. Now, the day of the Lord comes like a thief. That's at the sixth seal. But believe me, when, the, when your kid comes home from college with the mark of the beast, right, within days following the abomination of desolation event during the start to the fifth seal, when all of these kids are coming home and going to the malls and they're getting this mark of the beast, and they're going to see all these miracles worked. And they start diming out their parents and diming out the grandparents and saying, those, there they are. And your kids are going to go after, your grandkids are going to go after the ones working miracles when, they're, when Satan is here. And, but they're not going to listen to you because you waited too long to warn them about what's going to happen and the order in which it's going to happen. All you're saying is don't worry about these things. Just abide in Christ and you have nothing to worry about. Well, part of that's true. 
If they were called by the Lord and chosen by the Lord, they will call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. But if he didn't call upon them and choose them, even though the word of God has come upon them, it won't take root unless they've been given the Holy Spirit. And all of these Christians, which I've heard someone recently call them posers, and, and, and that's true, people who say they're Christians, but the Holy Spirit has not been sent to them, therefore the truth has not taken root, they shall be shaken off of Jesus during this time. So we should watch and pray now that our family shall be called and chosen by the Lord. Please, Father, send my children your spirit in advance and keep them from the evil one. Hallelujah. All right, where do we leave off at to end the lesson? Joel 2, verse... 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. When's that? At the first trumpet. The same day the sixth seal is loosed, the cosmic signs begin. Here comes the Antichrist army like a plague of locusts coming upon the land. A grain offering. Let's see. 16. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. To show you how confused we've been, we, the church, has been over the centuries, there's people in the church that used to teach that was the rapture. At that time, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. That has nothing to do with the rapture. That's saying everybody needs to meet and be told in the streets, in the uh, plaza, everyone needs to come out, stop what you're doing, and be told what's happening. And we all need to roll around in sackcloth. This is what they're going to say. And we need to beg Father for forgiveness because we see the massive horde army coming upon us. And we're, being, we're, we're, we're under fire. Here comes the cruise missiles. Here comes the meteors from Father. Here comes the, the rocket fire from Gaza. Here it comes. Stop what you're doing. Even a wedding needs to stop. A funeral needs to stop. Come and pray. This is the, uh, the time of the end. We realize it now. We've been tricked. That Messiah is not our Messiah. That's Satan. But it's too late. You done took his mark. All right. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Why? Because the end has come upon his people. It's Daniel 11, 40b. It's uh, Amos 8. Let them say, spare your, you, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then we have verse 18 and 19 and 20 talking about what Jesus coming. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land. And pity his people. When? Give me the good news, brother. When does that happen? When they acknowledge their offense and the power of the holy people has been completely broken and shattered and the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim have been trampled underfoot. All right. When that has been accomplished, when the it is done can be screamed in Revelation 16, 17, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, this is behold of I, uh, Revelation 16, 15. I am coming quickly. I will send you grain and new wine and oil. Of course, now it starts going into uh, what the kingdom is going to be like. All right. I will no longer make you a repro reproach among the nations like I did in phase one, but I will remove far from you the northern army. This is the first northern army, the Antichrist northern army. This is not the ten kings who turn against the beast after the seventh bowl and come out of the north. This mentioned in Jeremiah 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51. This is the first northern army that overflows the banks of the Euphrates River like a flood. I will drive him, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the wicked counselor, the vile one, 
away into a barren and desolate land with his face towards the eastern sea, all right, the Dead Sea, and his back towards the western sea, all right, the Mediterranean Sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise. Isaiah 14 is what you should be thinking of now because he has done monstrous things, all right, turning the world into a wilderness. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Okay. Do not be afraid, you beast of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine. So the marvelous things, the marvelous work, um, begins at the sixth seal. But it goes on during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, and the marvelous things continue throughout the early days of the millennium. It's all marvelous. It's all wondrous, not wonderful. But this is talking about the marvelous things during the, millennia, uh, during the early days of the millennium. Do not be afraid, you beast of the field. For the open pastures are springing up, and the trees bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Okay, this is the kingdom coming to earth. Be glad then, you children of Zion, the ones who are left alive. Remember, one third will be brought through the fire. And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. Okay, again, this is the, the words of encouragement about what all of these days will lead to, the kingdom. Uh, verse 24, the threshing floor shall be full of wheat, the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years of the swarming locust has eaten. Why is it years? Because the day of the Lord takes three years. Within three years, says Isaiah 16. Years that the, see right there, years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. All right, this is the same you over here in verse 6 of Isaiah 29. You, all right, this first northern army. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. See how Father is saying, talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me slow down. This is important. So many people still don't get this. He's about to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb that starts uh, the millennium. My great army, which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. So before you barf and throw up at what we just read, this is not saying that People left alive are going to eat the flesh of the people who died, who came against them. This is talking about what they bring. They bring truckloads and tractor trailer loads full of wine and meat and bread and cans of Chef Boyardee, okay? And Ezekiel 39, which is talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb, says that these armies that come against Jerusalem shall bring animals with them. Ram and fatted cattle and fatted oxen, okay? So the marriage supper of the Lamb is when Jesus leads the plundering of those who plundered his people. And he rolls their vehicles over like a rolling thing before the wind, all right? And guess what? Jesus is going to cast down hailstones, a hundred pounds. All right. Imagine what that's going to do to cattle. All right. And to sheep and to rams. It's going to quarter them, basically. All right. It's going, it's going to gut them. It's going to quarter them. And then what's Jesus do after the hail? Blowing fire on them. So you may not even have to cook a lot of this meat on the mountains of Israel during the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is going to cook it to perfection. And this will be the first sacrifice to Father during the millennial reign of Christ. And that's the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's not in the third heaven like it's been taught for hundreds of years. It's on the mountains of Israel. 
when Jesus leads his people, immortal and mortal, in the plundering of those who plundered his people. Hallelujah. So that's what that's talking about. Who has dealt wondrously with you? And my people shall never be put to shame after this. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And that is exactly how Nahum chapter 1 ends. Never again will there be a wicked counselor or vile one to pass through the land. Verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also in my, my uh, men's servants and my maid servants. Um, I will pour out my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming and great and awesome day of the Lord. When does it come? Six seal. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said among the remnant, the Lord calls. So who is it that's going to call upon the name of the Lord? Whoever the Lord calls, and they shall not be tricked by the mark of the beast or the false Messiah. Hallelujah. Well, brothers and sisters, let's end this lesson. Thank you for staying with me. It's been a long one. Uh, even if you had to watch it in parts, I thank you. I hope my mistakes have aided your understanding. I hope you share this. If you've never shared my videos before, I hope you share this one. This is going to help a lot of people, and it explains what Matthew 24 is talking about. Hallelujah. We've got to warn our children about all of this and the coming falling away. Until I see you again, brothers and sisters, God bless.